Good morning. Thank you for coming out to my session um, on elegant async patterns and different functional programming techniques you guys can use right now uh, to help scale your JavaScript up to multiple cores. If that sounds a little bit crazy and you're thinking, wait a minute, JavaScript can even do this? Hang tight. We'll get there. Uh, so I'm Jonathan Martin, or you can find me at Nibbler on the web. Had one of the awesome calligraphy artists do this, uh, spell this out. So if you haven't already checked out their booth, by the way, you should check it out. They're really, really good at what they do. Um, and I'm an instructor and web developer for a consultancy in the USA. It's called Big Nerd Ranch. Uh, Big Nerd Ranch uh, develops web and mobile apps for our clients. And we also teach developers to do the same through intensive five-day boot camps, mostly in the US. And then also we fly out um, to many of our clients around the globe. We also teach developers through our best-selling programming guides. So maybe you've seen some of these before, especially in the iOS and Android space. And we have a front-end web development guide as well. Uh, outside Big Nerd Ranch, I'm also a digital nomad, which really just means that I leverage technology to work from anywhere in the globe. So some of these areas might be where I might be working any given day. This isn't quite the norm yet. I'm working up towards this. Um, so over the last three years, this lifestyle in particular has really helped me to nurture my love for landscape photography. So uh, if you don't like JavaScript or multi-threading, which seems unusual since you came to a JS comp, uh, you can go look at pretty pictures instead. For now, I'll assume that's not the case, since it is JS comp. So um, when I was accepted to come speak here at Budapest, I was pretty excited. So I started to piece together my travel plans for speaking here in Budapest. I'm slightly obsessed with the to-do list, so uh, I started listing out the things I need to complete before I could give this talk in Budapest. Of course, I need to fly out here. It'd be a little bit hard to give it over Hangouts. Internet connections in Alabama are the slowest in the US. Uh, also, I would need to put together a slide deck, so I needed to work on those. I'd probably need to get packed for the trip. I some phone calls I need to make before that trip. And probably on the flight, I should read a book. And at least sometime before my session, I needed to take a shower. So lists are great. And, uh, but to really start knocking out these to-dos, of course, you need to figure out, well, what order am I going to do these in? What's going to be my plan for uh, completing these? So I could just naively go from top to bottom and complete them one by one. In that case, I probably would have never made it out here since I didn't actually have the slide deck finished until a few minutes ago. So I probably would never have flown out here, and so I wouldn't be here. So that's one strategy I could use. I could go from top to bottom, finish these one by one. But we're human. We don't actually finish things this way. Uh, we tend to do more than one thing at a time. So for example, um, some of these things could happen at the same time. You know, Maybe on my flight, I could work on my slide deck. Uh, if I was able to stay awake for that flight. So if I were smarter when writing my to-do lists, maybe I could encode constraints and preferences so I could better plan how to tackle this uh, really onerous to-do list. For example, I could encode my constraints as arrows, which show that some things logically have to come before others. For example, I have to pack before my flight, and I have to fly before I can speak. I also have to work on my slide deck, but really, that can happen any time before I give my talk. So long as it happens before then, I could work on it before or after my flight. Now, some of these things also can't happen at the same time. For example, I can't make a phone call while I'm on the plane, and I can't read a book while I'm in the shower, as awesome as that sounds. Together, these describe my constraints and preferences for how I'm going to get ready for my JS Conf talk. Software also deals with to-do lists of its own, and the problem is twofold. We need a way to model constraints and preferences for how work gets done, and we need to figure out the optimal solution that satisfies all those constraints and preferences. And the way we solve these two problems is a defining characteristic of many different programming languages, including JavaScript. Now, before I hop into the body of this session, I want to recap some terminology briefly. In particular, we're going to toss around the terms concurrency and parallelism. Parallelism, excuse me. Concurrency just means that two or more computations have overlapping timelines with each other in terms of execution. So for example, task three begins before task two and task one, but before task three completes, task one and task two will already begin computing. So that's what I mean by overlapping timelines. Now, how you achieve that concurrency is really up to you. There's a lot of different strategies you could use. One example is you could switch really quickly between working on these three tasks. 
So in particular, in software, we could use multi-threading to do this. A, um, a single CPU core can really only do one thing at a time, but by quickly switching, we could have these overlapping execution timelines. Context switching makes it seem like we're doing three things at the same time, even though we aren't. There's another way we could do this. We could have three separate machines or CPU cores and dedicate one core per task. This specific form of concurrency is often called parallelism. So to summarize, concurrent programs can run multiple pieces of code independently of each other, and multi-threading and parallelism are just two execution strategies for running code concurrently. So how we write our code, our choice of style, isn't really going to vary much based on our choice of do we write it in parallel or multi-threaded. So for this talk, I'm not going to distinguish between them. I'm just going to collectively re refer to it as concurrency. So after this point, you don't have to remember any of those crazy things. We're just always going to talk about code being concurrent, which just means two or more things, two or more functions, perhaps, are running at the same time. Now, some of you gave me a, a funny little wink uh, when I said something about multi-threading and JavaScript in the same sentence. So Node and front-end developers alike are commonly trolled by the classic question, how do you scale a JavaScript code base since it's single-threaded? A little bit of a loaded question. But in fact, not only is it multi-threaded, JavaScript is highly concurrent by default thanks to the event loop. But it shields us at the same time from many of the multi-threading woes and synchronization primitives you might be familiar with in other languages, like semaphores, mutexes, locks, et cetera. So for example, each of these web API calls seamlessly fires up a separate thread for a total of four threads. You have the main orchestrator thread, which is where you write this code. And then you also get these three others in the background for free that are powering these different APIs. So how on earth does that actually work? If JavaScript is multi-threaded, how is it that everything seems like you is running on one thread, which means that there's only one call stack and there's one thing happening at a time? So how can you write your code in such a way that it looks like it's single-threaded, but it's actually taking advantage of multiple cores? Well, that's where the event loop comes in. Now, in 30 minutes, I can't actually do full justice in explaining the event loop. Um, so let me just give you a quick recap and just keep in mind that I'm lying to you quite a bit. So it's grossly inaccurate. I'll forward you guys to a, a slightly better uh, examination of the event loop near the end. So in the middle of this slide, we have the call stack. And the call stack just helps us keep track of what is currently executing. You might think of this, and if this is your main JavaScript file and the pages just started up, you might think of this as the main function. If you have a callback executing, then you could imagine that callback is on the call stack. So on the far left, we have the built-in web APIs, and these are natively implemented. Uh, for equivalency, this could also be the Node APIs. Node works the same way. It also uses the event loop. And then finally, on the far left, we have our source code that we've written, we've loaded into the browser, and now we're going to start executing it. So the first line is performing an AJAX request, and it executes a function called parse once we receive an AJAX response. Second, we're using the set timeout API to schedule a refresh function to run in about five seconds or so. And finally, we use the index DB API to make a database query and invoke a function called render once that query has completed. So how is the JavaScript runtime actually going to go about evaluating this code? Some of these operations, for example, will take a while. An AJAX request might take a few hundred milliseconds, or it might take several seconds, depending on the connection you're on. So JavaScript is going to evaluate these in a very specific order. And so let's, just to build up our understanding of the event loop, we're going to walk through this ourselves. So as soon as that fetch function is invoked, you can imagine that that's currently on the call stack and it fires up a natively implemented web API in the background. But it doesn't just fire up the fetch API. It also passes along a function or callback to invoke once that fetch API receives the AJAX response. Now, while that fetch web API is running in the background, the runtime will advance to the next line and go ahead and execute it without waiting for the AJAX request to finish. This is how we think of asynchronous coding in JavaScript. The set timeout API also fires up a native web API and passes along a callback to execute once the time is up. It's a very similar behavior. So IndexedDB works exactly the same way. It fires up a native web API, and it passes a callback to execute 
to in the IndexedDB web API. So now what? We're out of source code to execute. There's nothing on the call stack. In most languages, this would mean that your program is dead. It's not running anything. However, we do have those native web APIs still crunching some code for us in the background. And so let's say that when the IndexedDB query finishes, it will alert the JavaScript runtime by pushing that render callback we gave it onto a queue. It's very imaginatively named the callback queue. Now, this doesn't yet run our render function. So the event loop is actually just a mechanism that checks to see if there's anything currently running. In other words, is there something in the call stack? And if there is something in the callback queue. If there's nothing in the call stack and there's at least something on the callback queue, the event loop will pop off that first callback off the queue and push it onto the call stack, which means that now our render function is executing. Now, while that render function is executing, it could take a while, um, another web API might finish its background work, perhaps our AJAX request. So the web API will immediately push the parse function onto the callback queue. However, this time there is code already on the call stack being executed. So that parse function is actually just going to stay in the callback queue. This behavior is called run to completion. It guarantees that the currently executing function will not be interrupted by another callback, which in a nutshell means you don't have to worry about thread safety. Uh, now when that current function on the call stack takes a long time to finish, this is what we call blocking the event loop. You can just imagine that if the event loop keeps trying to figure out, hey, can I push something? Can I push something yet? Can I grab one of these callbacks and start executing it? It's blocked until the call stack is empty. Now, during this time, our timer API might also finish, and it just pushes the refresh function onto that callback queue and waits to be executed. Once that render function finally finishes executing, the call stack is now empty, which means that the event loop can pop the first callback off the callback queue and push it onto the call stack, which means it's being executed. That's what's currently being executed. And of course, once the parse function finishes, the call stack will again be empty, so we can push that final refresh callback and then execute that to completion. So in summary, while our own JavaScript code looks like it's single-threaded, and in a way it is actually single-threaded, meaning there's only one call stack and only one function running at a time, the native background web APIs that power JavaScript can be executed on separate background threads seamlessly. It's not even something we have to think about. Now, not all of the async web APIs use separate threads, but the mental model holds, and it helps explain why Node.js and JavaScript in the browser can perform so much work concurrently while appearing single-threaded. Makes it very easy to reason about. Again, this was a highly inaccurate version of this. Um, I hope that sets the stage, at least, for the rest of the session. But you owe it to yourself to watch Philip Roberts talk on this subject. It's called Help. I'm stuck in an event loop. You can check out this link, bit.ly, event loop help. Really great talk. And it's only 20 minutes. So the event loop is great. But in Node.js, you can pretty soon hit a scaling limit with a single process, despite the many background threads. So at this point, many developers typically turn to something like Node's cluster module or PM2. But turning to multiprocessing too soon negates many of the single process benefits we enjoy and the predictability of having a single call stack in JavaScript. Now, luckily, a single JavaScript runtime thread can actually orchestrate an amazing amount of work. But to write code that, all, that will scale easily and doesn't look like a bunch of promise.all spaghetti, we'll need to exercise a few patterns. So in the remainder of this session, we're going to cover these three different patterns and recipes that you can use both in your Node.js and your front-end web applications to write scalable, performant code that remains elegant and actually scales to multiple cores. We're going to do that also without any third-party libraries, no frameworks or fads, just plain old JavaScript, ES2017 specifically. So the first pattern is coordinating concurrency with async Iffies. You probably have all heard of and seen iffies, so async iffies uh, should bring up some interesting ideas. So when you do more than one thing at a time, you usually need some ugly pipelining to describe how those different tasks are related to each other. So here's a concrete example. Let's say we're building iTunes in the browser, and we're beginning to write the code for importing MP3 files into our music library. 
in the browser, the user might import these files by dragging and dropping them into the browser. This is not a theoretical app, by the way. All the technology for this exists. Um, if you're interested, I'll show you guys um, a demo of basically iTunes in the browser and working with MP3s, some cool blog posts and stuff. So we might imagine if we're writing this MP3 importer, there are five steps to import a song. First, we need to read in the MP3 file's contents. We might have a file object, and so we might need to read that in to some sort of binary data type in JavaScript. Then from that, we might want to parse out the song's title, the album name, and some other useful metadata. In most MP3s, this information is encoded in the beginning of the file. It's a format called ID3. If you're interested in how to parse that data and working with binary data in JavaScript, check out the blog post. It's bit.ly slash mp3-parser. Now, unfortunately, ID3 metadata doesn't usually include the song's duration. So we'll actually need to calculate it ourselves, and we can do that using the web's audio API. And once all that metadata is extracted, we're going to auto-create a new album in the database if one doesn't already exist by that name. And then we'll finally create a new song entry in our music library using all the information from those previous four steps. So my first solution when I was coding this up looked roughly like this. Very much the code corresponds exactly with those steps. We read in the file. In this case, we're reading it in as an array buffer, which is JavaScript's binary data type. And then we uh, parse out ID3 metadata. This is a library I've got on GitHub you guys can check out. And it's just using a lot of those binary files. And then we're calculating the duration using some audio APIs. In particular, this is audio context. And then we're creating entries in the database for the album and then for the song. Now, you'll notice that async and await makes this code really nice. We've got a lot of asynchronous stuff happening here. And all we have to do is put in await in front of every line that would return a promise. This gets rid of all the dot then callback, so this looks really nice. There's a problem, however. We're actually blocking too much. Anytime you see a wait, just realize that no code below that await will execute. In other words, we're kind of hamstringing JavaScript's pattern of just going line by line by line without pausing for a breath. So unfortunately, we're actually forcing more things than necessary to execute one after another, when in reality, they could be executing in parallel, or I should say concurrently. But if we wanted to execute some of this code concurrently, you know, we might squint at this and try to figure out, hmm, some of these things, yeah, they can run in concurrently. Um, but to do that, we have to sacrifice those really elegant awaits. Here's one way we might do that. We could use promise.all to block further code until the file reader and the parser have finished uh, before computing the song's duration or importing an album. Not only does this uglify the solution quite a bit, but more disturbingly, it's still a suboptimal solution. If the file reader, for example, finishes before the parser, there's no reason the import album couldn't already begin doing its work. The problem is it takes a fair amount of work to figure out the optimal grouping of which tasks can be run in parallel. And any time you switch any one of these steps from a synchronous API to an async one, it completely changes that optimal solution, which means you're going to have a lot of code churn. You're going to have very large Git diffs. So luckily, there's another way that we can model these kinds of concurrency relationships. Um, so what if we modeled each chunk of code as a dependency graph for the runtime to evaluate, just like we did with uh, my to-do list for coming to speak at JSConf? To accomplish this, we're going to use a pattern called the async immediately invoked function expression. It's an elegant pattern for managing concurrency on a single thread. Now, most of you have probably already seen async functions. Something to keep in mind is that an async function, when invoked, always returns a promise, no exception. Even if there's an error, it just returns a promise that rejects. So the return value from an async function invoked is always a promise. So an async iffy is just you create an async function, an anonymous one, and you invoke it. So the async iffy allows us to group together sequential code into a single unit we might call a task, and then immediately invokes it. A task can depend on other tasks as a source of input, but it produces a single return value as its output, which means that this async iffy is going to return a promise that resolves to the result. 
Now, the task local variable that you see is also going to be a promise. So if there's one thing you should take away from this talk, it should be the async iffy design pattern. It kind of resembles um, a task in a task runner like a gulp, um, like gulp or a make file. So if it helps, you can think of async iffies as sort of like those different tasks in a task runner. Now, if we refactored our MP3 importer code into multiple tasks, here's one way we might break it down. So first, when we read in that file, this just returns a promise. Just for naming conventions, I might call this the read task. And then the meta task would just run that parsing code. Now you notice, in every single one of these tasks, all these operations depend on the very previous line. In other words, there's no line in any of these tasks that doesn't depend on everything before it. We've tried to separate that out into these small chunks. Now, each task is an async iffy, so it returns a promise, which evaluates to the function's return value. At the very end, the thing that kind of kickstarts this process is when we're awaiting the song import task, which is sort of the top-level task that calls all these others. So with multiple tasks, we're just leveraging local variables and concurrency by default to essentially create a dependency graph which the JavaScript runtime will optimally evaluate for us no matter how complex it is. So if we were to break these down, you could imagine that this is the dependency graph that we've just modeled. But we didn't actually have to type this out ourselves. We didn't have to explicitly define that execution order. Just by wrapping sequential chunks of code into async iffies, we modeled the constraints and let JavaScript figure out how to satisfy those constraints. Again, there's tons more to the async iffy pattern, so definitely check out this blog post to learn more, bit.ly slash async dash iffy. Leave that up just for a moment. So our second step to creating elegant, scalable code is to define execution preferences. Async iffies allow us to define those constraints, how things have to execute. But a lot of times, you want to say, how would we like these things to be executed? How would we like to prioritize them? In particular, how could we throttle how many things are allowed to run concurrently with functional programming? So our MP3 importer right now runs as fast as possible, which is fabulous. But this is a browser, so we need to be considerate of the CPU, which is, after all, a limited resource. So async if has let us define those execution constraints. How could we declaratively define our preferences for how that work gets executed on the CPU? For example, in our application, if a user drops in a very large collection of MP3s, by default, uh, we might either import all these songs one by one, which is not so cool, or we might import them all at once. Neither solution is great. In particular, if we started importing all of them at once, we might get this really irritating progress bar behavior like this, where it jumps from, oh, I'm importing the first one, and then 20 seconds later, it jumps all the way to the end. Since all those songs started importing at the same time, the progress bar is basically meaningless to the user, and it will often lock up the browser. Also not great. So instead, what if we said, well, we only want to import a few songs at a time, and then we'll queue up the others for import once another song finishes importing. So only importing a few at a time. So in many threaded languages, you can accomplish something like this with semaphores. Semaphores are an object that represent a limited resource, and you can acquire and release access to it to basically throttle how many times or how many people are trying to use that semaphore. So for example, the CPU is an example of something a semaphore might represent. It could be a database or even network I.O. At their extreme, we could limit it to one client at a time, which we would call a mutex. Now, in an object-oriented paradigm, we could initialize a semaphore object with the maximum number of concurrent clients and use a wait to acquire a spot in the queue before we execute our code. And then once a spot opens up, we do some things, and then we release our spot so another client can execute some code. So here's a sample object-oriented solution to creating a semaphore and it just tracks functions that are waiting to be executed, and whenever a spot opens up, it executes the next function in the queue. So this is very standard um, CS2101 type solution you would probably write for a semaphore. Um, unfortunately, there's some really brittle boilerplate with an object-oriented solution for a semaphore. Uh, in particular, we could easily write code that will acquire a semaphore, but never release it. 
perhaps we throw an exception which will blow up the rest of the function. So now that semaphore will never be released. So instead, here's a functional programming version of that same semaphore, and instead of returning an object, it's going to return a higher order function that wraps up other functions with a call to acquire and release. So you can almost think of it as, it, I can take any function and I'll prepend it with acquire and then uh, suffix it with dot release. So to use this functional semaphore, we can invoke it with an async function. Now there's no way a semaphore can be acquired but not released. Now we're actually only one step away from turning this into a really elegant higher order function that doesn't even force us to think about semaphores at all. So let's suppose that we want to limit how many times our import mp3 function is called. And we want to limit how many times it can be run concurrently. So in other words, if you call import mp3 four times right after each other, say we only want to allow two instances of that function to run at a time. And then it would delay the third and fourth invocations until there's a slot left, until one of those first two invocations is finished. So we could think of this function, we might call it limit. We could think of it as a decorator or higher order function. And it takes an async function that usually runs with unlimited concurrency, and it returns the same function, but now composed with throttling behavior. So this example would take our mp3 importer function and return a new function that looks exactly the same, but only allows two instances of that function to run concurrently. So in this example, Song 1 and Song 2 will immediately begin importing, but Song 3 won't even begin importing until Song 1 or Song 2 finishes, meaning there's a slot in the semaphore. Uh, the limit function, it turns out, is really easy to write with the semaphore we built. It's just three or four lines of code. But the key takeaway from this is that instead of focusing now on managing this abstract semaphore object, we're focusing on creating functions with new throttling behavior. It's really elegant and cuts down on potential bugs from trying to share a semaphore object throughout your code base. And it preserves your existing API. So that way, if you want to throttle concurrency in your code base, you don't have to refactor your code or change any of your APIs. Again, there's a whole lot more we could dive into here. So feel free to check out the source code, in particular for the semaphore, uh, if you want to play around with that a bit on GitHub. But the final component of this talk is how can we create our own long-lived async tasks with a web worker cluster? So what do I mean by this? So the browser comes with a huge selection of async APIs that we use all the time. These APIs are natively implemented. There's not JavaScript code behind an AJAX request. Uh, so for example, the fetch and index DB APIs are all natively implemented, and they use promises and other asynchronous mechanisms like callbacks. Now, under the hood, the browser handles this by managing a dedicated thread pool that's ready to crunch those async APIs for you whenever you try to use one of these async APIs. But what if you could create your own? How would you create your own native async APIs for your own long-lived async operations that maybe they take up a lot of time and you don't want to block the main thread? For example, maybe we want to move our MP3 importer off the main thread, which is also rendering the UI, Maybe we want to move it to the background so that way it won't lock up the UI if it takes a particularly long time to import some of these MP3s. Well, web workers are essentially that. They're a standard web API for creating background threads. So to create a web worker, we just invoke the worker constructor and give it the path to the JavaScript code that will execute with its own dedicated scope and with its own event loop. It's completely isolated from your main thread. Now to communicate with a worker, you can only exchange messages. This is a really important concept. Those of you who have maybe tried Elixir or some of these high concurrency, high fault tolerance type languages are probably already familiar with this concept of exchanging messages. Basically, it means the worker must be listening for that message and handle it as part of its own event loop cycle. So in other words, messages are received asynchronously. Now, the main thread and the worker thread don't have to both block to exchange that message, they just send and check for messages whenever they're ready to. Now, the basic web worker API is not exceptionally elegant. If you want to have a two-way conversation between the worker and main thread, it can really quickly turn into this really ugly callback soup. So what if web workers looked more like an async web API call, where we invoke it and we get a promise in return that resolves to the worker's end result? That would make it really trivial to move CPU-intensive computations to a separate thread 
so we don't end up blocking the main thread. So you can imagine there's probably a lot of use cases for this. Up until cryptography was added to the browser standards, cryptography would have been a really common use case. Same for doing any sort of 3D graphics, maybe game rendering. Maybe you'd like to move these to the background off the main thread, but you don't want to have to completely rewrite your code base to take advantage of it. So in particular, we're going to take our MP3 importer and move it into a worker and treat it as though it were a natively implemented async web API. To do this, we're going to create this mysterious cluster function to make the web worker API a little bit more elegant for our use case. And cluster is just going to spin up a bunch of web workers in the background for us. And these web workers will handle the task of importing MP3s. So with functional programming, the implementation for this cluster is actually really terse. So this code has a lot of stuff at the beginning. Basically, it figures out what's the best number of web workers to use. Usually, that's how many virtual cores you have. So it creates these different workers, and it puts them in an array to keep track of. It's basically a pool of workers. And each time we try to invoke that cluster, it grabs a worker from the pool that's currently unused, and it forwards along some data. So this would be us invoking cluster. We pass some arguments. Those arguments get forwarded to the worker. Once the worker finishes and replies with the result, it adds itself back to the pool to say, hey, I'm not currently working on anything. You can use me for a different computation. And the overall promise will evaluate to that result. The code for the web worker itself is really short. It's an infinite loop that just receives data from the main thread. It does some work, and then it notifies the main thread when it's done with that computation. By the way, this isn't just for the browser. You can use um, a popular facade library to write web workers in Node as well with the same API. And under the hood, it uses native multi-threading. So this isn't just for the front end browser. So you could imagine moving all kinds of CPU intensive operations with just a few lines of code. You can actually do it with fewer than this if you write a little utility function. You can imagine moving all of these into web workers. So uh, I'm a little bit low on time. So the TLDR from this really is that JavaScript in the browser and Node.js is highly concurrent out of the box. So things like async ifs can help us define those execution constraints. Thanks to the event loop, we don't have to even worry about thread safety or re-entrancy or a lot of these other things you might be familiar with, with a language like C or Java. And functional programming patterns keep us from making a mess of things just for the sake of that threading. It all happens pretty seamlessly for us. And if there isn't an async web API for something you need, maybe it's 3D graphics related or cryptography related, just write your own web worker and treat it like a native async web API. So the next time you're trolled, just remember you can always bet on JavaScript to help you leverage multi-core machines and crunch through to-do loops, uh, through to-do lists, so you won't uh, soak your favorite book in the shower like I did. So. My timeshare on this room's CPU is up, so if you like pretty pictures and travel stories, you can hop to my landscape photography site, yellowscale.com, or you can find me on Twitter as at Nibbler. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>